We got a crowd here. That's wonderful. We do. Hello. Good morning. And thank you so much for being here. I have been waiting to do this for three years. I got so excited <laughs> to be invited. And I've actually listened to Amanda narrate her book on Audible three different times. So I feel like I know you. <laughs> I and think you know me better than my parents. She, it might be. It's, it's, it's very possible. And my book is well used. It's a phenomenal book, and I really urge you all to read it if you haven't already done so. Um, Amanda Little is a professor of journalism and science writing at Vanderbilt. You must have been on a meteoric uh, tenure track to have <laughs> accomplished that in your young life. And um, she's been an expert on climate change and technology and energy. And then uh, in the last decade, she decided to focus on food, because after all, we are what we eat, and, uh, and food in a world now of 8 billion people and with climate change, there are enormous issues and we can't live without food. And so she dove into 11 different countries, uh, 13 different locations, running the spectrum from some of the most underprivileged people in the world, whether they're in Africa, to some of the new technology. Um, there was an enormous amount of her own growth during the book. So it's, it's fun because you feel like you're reading a story of a person who is learning as she learns and studies and investigates. And that's, it's really a priceless. She starts out by letting us know she does not have a green thumb. Uh, her, her garden in, in uh, Nashville was a bit of a disaster, but her husband and children kind of bailed her out, so to speak. <laughs> and... Uh, but she's, uh, she doesn't come with biases. You know, in the food area, you've got a lot of people whose beliefs uh, tailor what they, your science is. And, and so you're getting this opinion. And, and you know, like, and she'll, we're going to talk about GMOs, for example. It was fascinating just to read that chapter like others and to see how the, her own thinking evolved. But I want to begin with an open-ended question. Uh, I'm just going to use the subtitle of your book, What We'll Eat in a Bigger, Hotter, and Smarter World. So Amanda, what will we eat in this bigger, hotter, smarter world? Joe, thank you so much. I, I, I want to say that Joe has been such a wonderful ambassador of your community. I'm guessing many of you are, may know um, Joe, and you reached out three years ago when we were going to do this event um, with such a gracious um, uh, welcome and um, engagement in my work. I think you can tell, given the state of uh, this, the copy of this book, that he's done his homework. This is a physician who uh, is prepared uh, for, for clearly everything you do. So it's really a pleasure to talk with you. And I have been looking at the topic of food really through um, the lens of the environment and, um, and the economy and how farmers and um, food producers are shifting and adapting to these enormous environmental pressures. Um, but I've, come, I've become very interested in um, in, of course, the human health implications of this topic. You, you mean, food is a deeply emotional issue. It's a very important issue um, on so many levels. It intersects with, um, of course, the economy, the environment, public health. Um, but it's also um, fundamentally a very, very personal issue. And I had been looking at the climate topic since the early 2000s when I started writing um, about the environment uh, through the lens of the energy industry. And I moved into water. Um, and, um, and then I began to see that food is an issue that um, is sort of the love language of, of the environmentalism. It's the love language of, in some ways, the climate movement. Um, it's the place where, where these issues most intimately connect to us in our lives. Um, I mean, we can get an electric car if we can afford that um, and change to solar and wind and we can put, you know, do, make decisions in our lives that um, can sort of begin to adapt to more sustainable lifestyles. But what we do with our diets is much, I, I think, um, more complex um, and in some ways something that we all care about in a, in a kind of deeper way. And so from a storytelling standpoint, this was really important and interesting for me. Um, it's, a, it's so difficult. I teach climate and investigative environmental journalism. 
Uh, I, I teach science writing and I teach opinion writing. I teach all kinds of different writing. But the real challenge with telling the story of climate change and really exploring that is how do you make it feel emotionally immediate and accessible and important, right? It's so complex and vast and uh, it's just such a hard story to tell. And so for me, this was a way of really understanding the climate, um, uh, you know, climate change as a phenomenon in a much more human and intimate way. Um, and there is a paradox that is at sort of the, the, the beginning of this story. And the paradox of our food future is this. Uh, as you mentioned, global um, population is expected to grow from 10, uh, 8 to 10 billion people by mid-century in the next 30 years. Um, and at the same time, uh, the International Panel on Climate Change, which is this you know, collective of thousands of international scientists, has predicted that um, because of climate pressures, heat, drought, flooding, superstorms, invasive insects, blights, et cetera, all these different pressures from climate change, arable land, the, the, the land that can be um, reliably used for farming, could decline by two to 6% every decade going forward. Um, so we have increasing population, we have changing diets, more protein intensive diets, and declining arable land. Um, in theory, right? That's the that's that's the that's the paradox, right? More demand for food, less land to grow it on, right? Um, given these these pressures. So again, as a as a journalist and a storyteller, that was very interesting to me. I, as someone who loves to eat, also, <laughs> um, all these things became very interesting to me and sort of pushed me out of this realm of energy reporting um, into food and agriculture. Um, and along the way, I really had to challenge a lot of my assumptions and concerns about, um, about food systems, about technology and food, about what is sustainable food, what is affordable food. Um, and, and so all this, for me, became very interesting and led to what was a dimensional and very sort of multifaceted story, a personal story, uh, again, a story of economy and, um, and the environment. Um, but also really a story of sort of heart and soul because this fundamentally is something that we care about in a much more intimate way, as I said. Um, the most recent IPCC report had a comment in it that said, um, by mid-century, the world may reach a threshold of global warming beyond which current agricultural practices will no longer support large human civilizations. That is actually a direct quote that I committed to memory. Um, because it's pretty dramatic. But the operative word, the phrasing there is current agricultural practices will no longer support large human civilizations. Uh, and that's, that's, again, really chilling. There's a, there's a lot of um, really sort of intimidating um, <laughs> you know, implications in that, um, in that paragraph. But what I have begun, begun to see is that we're transforming agricultural practices in a really important way, in ways that redress and basically reform a lot of the problems with industrial agriculture. There are ways that we can sort of correct a lot of the mistakes we've made along the way to producing vast amounts of food that have been, it's been incredibly successful. We, we, we've been able to grow human population dramatically because of industrial agriculture. But it's flawed, it's chemically intensive, it's depleting the land, it's depleting the nutrients and the flavor in our food. And so we have to prepare for these pressures, these climate pressures, while also sort of correcting a lot of the problems in industrial agriculture. The single biggest threat of climate change is its impact on food systems. In, unlike you know, the transportation and the um, energy sectors, uh, we cannot continue forward with our current methods of food production when we have all these environmental pressures, right? You can keep running a coal plant for the most part in a, in a storm um, or in a heat wave. Um, you can drive your car through those things, but you, you know, your combustion engine car, uh, but you can't continue to farm. So while industrial agriculture contributes to the climate crisis, it's also very directly affected by it. So we're seeing more adaptation and innovation and response in, you know, among farmers, there's all this exciting innovation 
Um, some of it not great, but a lot of it is really, really exciting and, 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 and hopeful. Um, so this is a bellwether. How is this industry responding to these pressures? How can it become the solution, not the problem? And that's what I explore in this book. And I thought, oh, well, I'll just, you know, go to Iowa <laughs> and report this story. And then, of course, I realized, oh, the United States imports more than half of all of the fruits we consume. We import about 40% of all the vegetables we consume. Most of our fruits and vegetables um, consumed in this country are produced in this state. California is the bread basket and the fruit bowl and the dairy case of our country. This is the most important beating heart of, uh, of food production, not grains, that's mostly Midwest, but of, of the really delicious and nutritious foods. Um, and as you know, your state is under um, big stress because of heat and because of, of course, drenching rains and all these conflicting pressures. Um, so how do we adapt, right? I couldn't just tell it in one place. I had to tell it here. I had to tell it in the Midwest. I eventually realized, oh, I have to go to China and India and Eastern Africa. I have to um, look at uh, this story as it's playing out all over the world because we have a deeply interconnected global food system. And what was on my plate this morning or your plates this morning probably came from, unless you are a very virtuous backyard farmer, um, from many different places. So the story has many origins, um, but it, there are a lot of uh, solutions that really connect all those different disparate threads. And hopefully we'll be able to give you yeah. a sense of that. Now, you, you recognize and respect the importance of real food of nature yes. and what evolution gave us. But then, uh, so talk about the genetic modification of food. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So I look in this book at a whole range of things on our, you know, pretty much everything on our plates, right? The production of fruits and vegetables, the production of grains, the production of meats, um, uh, and all the different ways in which these foods are produced. I came into this um, story with a lot of concerns and questions um, about, you know, fake food, non-food, processed food, GMO foods, all of it. I have kids who are now 11 and 14. When I started this, um, this research, they were um, younger, probably five and eight. And, uh, and I really wanted to make good decisions about, you know, healthy organic foods. I could mostly afford to feed them all organic foods, but that was difficult and I work all the time. So it was very hard for me to get to the farmer's market and do this kind of virtuous food lifestyle. Um, does anybody else in the audience have, have a hard time with being a virtuous eater? <laughs> you have any troubles with that? Have you ever tried to be a vegetarian and sort of faltered? I, I love meat. I, I grew up in a household where chicken was considered a vegetable. It was like that's how much my mom believed in, in feeding us meats. My brothers and I are very, very tall. It might be because we were just like fed a steady diet of red meat our whole lives. Probably not. The physician will challenge me on that. But. Um, I was not a, you know, I was not able to do that lifestyle that Michael Pollan and Alice Waters were recommending. You know, eat food, mostly plants, not too much, or something in, the, in that order. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, you know, I, I love a Cheeto occasionally, um, and, and I love a burger, and I, you know, I just was really struggling with how to solve this problem of, you know, a, um, a really vulnerable food system if I couldn't be the solution in my own home, you know, if I couldn't, I knew so much about the problems, um, but I couldn't make those changes effectively in my own backyard or even in, I, you know, shop at Kroger. It was like, was that a crime? Um, how, how to do, how to do this, right? And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, non-foods. I didn't want to um, come at this with this kind of elitist perspective that the only way to be a good eater is to, you know, eat only organic, only backyard farm food because it's expensive and it's time intensive and, you know, to be a vegetarian. It's, it's very hard. It's, it's maybe accessible for 8% of the U.S. population 
for the rest of us, it's just unrealistic and it's really, really expensive. Um, so how do we do that? How do we reimagine sustainable food in a way that's affordable and accessible and practical? Um, how do we do, you know, um, you know, reimagine meat consumption in a way that's affordable and accessible and healthy? Um, and, you know, so I, 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 I want to preface this GMO thing by saying all of the questions I ask are how do we do this and how do I sort of check my own assumptions, right? I don't want to stop eating meat. How can I eat meat better? How can it be better pre produced and sourced? I don't want to, you know, I, I want to produce, uh, I want to support an agricultural system that's affordable, but what will that take? So GMOs, um, we need to set the record straight on GMOs, okay? Th this is one of those topics that understandably we have very serious concerns about. The applications of GMOs are kind of like the applications of television or an iPad, right? This is a technology platform for plant breeding that takes little bits of genetic information from um, other, other species and enters it into a plant species to get a desired trait, okay? Um, that's what breeding is and has been forever. The, the, we're always taking traits and integrating them to get a better, a better um, crop in the case of food, of food crops. Um, but the way that we've been applying that has essentially been, um, you know, inviting really questionable traits into plants. <laughs> the, m the most widely consumed GMO crops are um, uh, coated with genetic information that resists herbicides, that resists chemicals, so that we can add more and more chemicals to our crops. That's the, called Roundup Ready um, corn or Roundup Ready maize, right? Um, so, so essentially, we have used this very sophisticated breeding technology that alters plant genomes. All breeding alters plant genomes, but we've we've coded for plants that can tolerate more and more chemicals, um, and and that is the that is used on about seventy percent, or actually ninety percent of all the major grains uh, produced in this country, and and and. Um, non-food crops like cotton, for example. Um, very concerning because it means that we're consuming, you know, a, a lot more glyphosate or, you know, which is Roundup, this, this herbicide, because our plants are absorbing that, they can survive it, and it goes into our bodies. We now know that glyphosate is carcinogenic or cancer, um, uh, you know, uh, causing is quite, not, not quite the word, but associated with, with higher rates of cancer. And this is a really bad application of a breeding technology. But inherently, the practice of bringing genetic information, new genetic information into the plant has not been, um, by any scientist I've ever um, uh, interviewed and talked to, um, uh, assessed as um, harmful to human health, right? The question is not should we use advanced breeding technologies for crops, it's how do we apply them in a way that's beneficial to human health and to the environment. And the way that we've been using this is, has been very damaging. Um, it's been very profitable for the agriculture industry, um, but the big advantage of these advanced breeding techniques like GMOs or CRISPR, which is an editing technique which snips out genetic information in a crop, the advantage is that it's much, you can much more quickly adapt um, new varietals. You can much more quickly develop a new strain of, let's say, wheat. And there's a, you may have seen in, in headlines that there's this new kind of wheat called HB4 that was, um, uh, which is again, bad branding. You don't want to call a crop like a, a series of letters and numbers. But this is a really important um, innovation in the, or, or sort of new kind of uh, milestone in the discussion around GMOs. In, in food production. Because HB4 is the first crop that ha was approved by the FDA that was developed for drought tolerance. It's a wheat crop that um, has genetic information from a sunflower, um, which are very efficient in the way they process water. Sunflowers are incredibly drought resilient. So the scientists actually, um, this, this genetic information was discovered in Argentina the scientists discover, oh, this gene helps a plant withstand drought. 
and they were able to pull that into the wheat crop. And um, in trials, the wheat crops were able to um, withstand drought about 20% more yield in drought conditions from the, that you know, new genetic information. Um, and this is a big deal because what, what, what it means is that we can maybe start thinking about how to apply these technologies um, in ways that are, again, beneficial and build climate resilience. They can develop this new strain of wheat in one to two years using these, these, these methods. But conventional breeding techniques take about eight to 10 years. So if you are a farmer in uh, Eastern Africa, where I, uh, uh, Southeastern Africa, where I began to research some of, some of the GMO um, uh, science, um, and you are in uh, you know, really stressed conditions, very drought stressed conditions, um, you're barely surviving. There's barely enough food. And someone says, hey, you're going to have 20% more chance of sustaining your own um, uh, you know, lives uh, with this crop. It's, it's, it's a much different conversation than should I have labels on my GMO corn chips, right? Um, so the, the, for, for many populations... And, and increasingly for our own in this American Southwest where you're seeing a lot of, you know, produ productive agricultural land go offline because of water stress. Um, this can be a really important way to begin to adapt to these kinds of pressures, okay? And does it, you know, we have seen erroneous associations between um, GMO crops and human health impacts, like lab rats got you know, uh, tumors because of, G of GMO, um, you know, genetic engineering. Um, and all of that has de been debunked. Every single major scientific agency has debunked that. In some ways, the misconceptions and the misunderstandings about human health impacts of GMOs are as severe as, the, as climate denial or, or as, you know, distortions of climate science. But it is true that a lot of the applications of the technology have been deeply flawed and bad for human health, right? Because, again, in the case of this most widely used GMO crop, it's tolerating more chemicals, and that's the problem. The problem is the chemicals. It's not the method of breeding, right? So as with so many of the innovations that come online, we have to think about not whether we should use them, but how to apply them in ways that benefit human health and the environment. Um, we, have a, we need a new prism for the conversation, right? And this is true of alternative meats. It's true of uh, vertical farms or these indoor cropping centers that now are producing um, fruits and vegetables without um, soil and sun with these uh, indoor environments. Um, there are ways to apply some of these innovations that can be greatly beneficial to human health and the environment. And there are ways to do it recklessly and poorly. So, so much of this conversation needs to be around how do we do this right? Um, and I think we're beginning to see really exciting and very responsible applications of some of these um, innovations, including GMOs. Very good. You know, every chapter is a dive. It's a story of a, of a different topic, which is what makes the book so rich. One topic I'd like to, to focus on, because it's incredibly fascinating, is laboratory meat, uh, which is yeah. in development. Now, this is real meat. This isn't veggie burgers or impossible meat. This is real meat, which I love uh, you did the, this tasting test. But this <laughs> is meat without killing the animal. So talk about laboratory meat. Yes, yeah, I was really worried about this. I heard, I heard uh, a, a what in the front <laughs> row, um, which is exactly where I was. And I even said, what the mm, if uh, when I had to sign a, like basically sign my life away before I tried this, um, what's called cellular meat or, or cellular agriculture. Um, and it is, again, one of these parts of this story that we have this Im immediate gag reflex. Like, I don't want this crazy, weird technology in my food. Um, and let me just say again that the sort of big challenge with this conversation, when we think about bringing innovation or technology into our in, in, into food production, is um, 
you know, is this is this big controversy that's actually very much in this state, right? You have Silicon Valley up there, everybody's saying, let's throw technology at this problem. And then you have the sustainable foodies who are saying, I want technology out of my food, thank you very much. Um, you know, the whole problem, the reason we got into this mess is because we put too much technology into food. Um, but you, so you have these very sort of polarized interpret, you know, sort of positions here. Either we, let's do more tech, or let's do no tech and go back to Mesopotamian plows and chicken coops and backyard farms and all that. And I'm all for the plow. Um, but, um, but, but how do we, again, those, a lot of those sort of very zero tech approaches are very expensive and, and uh, can't feed the, 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 you know, the 8 billion people on this earth realistically. Um, so the meat industry is a big challenge because huge... I mean, overwhelmingly, um, the uh, greenhouse gases produced by the agriculture industry are coming from meat production. 30 to 40 percent, it's about 37 percent of all grains produced on planet Earth feed livestock, right? So, and 70 percent of all fresh water consumed by humans on Earth flow to agriculture. Overwhelmingly, that goes to grain production, and overwhelmingly, grain production goes to um, to cattle and livestock production. Um, so the land use and all the chemicals that we're using, it's overwhelmingly going to, um, to cattle feed, uh, and, um, and a, a lot of that land is very stressed, right? It's, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, and uh, in the last 50 years, global population has doubled, meat consumption has tripled, right? Part of what's happening with these emerging economies and this kind of growing wealth of countries um, all over the world is, is a higher demand for expensive proteins, um, which in theory is great for our bodies and, and you know, meat's a very efficient and delicious way to, to deliver protein, um, but it's very, very uh, um, uh, environmentally intensive. So how do we do high level, high, you know, sophisticated delicious protein production um, with less land Less, fewer chemicals, um, and in a way that's um, you know viable in this very climate-stressed world. One way that has been discussed is called cellular agriculture, and what you do is you take a sort of biopsy of cells from a you know heritage chicken or from a you know um, a, 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 a cow, and you cultivate those cells in environment, give them a um, an, an environment to do what they naturally do, which is replicate. Um, and in fact, this, it's basically called um, you know, tissue culture, um, which has been used in medicine for decades, right? Um, cultivating tissues for medical applications, uh, especially, um, I think, in heart surgeries and so forth. They have uh, um, you know, tissue culture development. Stem cells. Stem cells, exactly. So, um, the man behind this is um, a cardiologist named Uma Valetti, who was at the Mayo Clinic, and he was working on, um, on this, these medical applications of tissue cultures. He had moved from India to the United States, and he um, was so overwhelmed by the uh, consumption of meat, at the volumes of meat that we're consuming, and all of the actually human health problems associated with that. So he said, hey, if, we're, if we can do you know, healthy tissue culture development um, for medical applications, why not do this in agriculture? And so uh, in about 2014, he began to develop um, some applications of what is now called cellular agriculture. His company, um, which was initially called Memphis Meats, is now called Upside, um, just got approval from the FDA um, to, uh, uh, as, as producing um, meat products that are cellularly identical to animal meats, um, they are animal meats. They're just produced outside of the body of the animal. Um, so they're produced without the bones and the feathers. It's, it's, it's muscle and fat cells. That's essentially what um, they produce. Um, and those are exactly what we eat, is muscle and fat from, from the animal. Um, so, but they're produced without the bones and the feathers and the hooves and the brains and the sentience of the animal. Or the death. What's that? Or the death of the animal. Or the death of the animal. Now, the key point is that when we harvest meat from a cow, for example, you harvest about 40% of the body mass of the cow. 
So 60% of all of that animal is waste. And all of those, you know, enormous, that enormous acreage of land grown for feed and the water, it's 1,800 um, um, gallons of water for each pound of meat produced, in, in the case of, uh, of, of beef, um, it's a huge amount of resources going toward the production of an animal we only eat 40% of and essentially throw out the rest. I mean, there are applications for the rest of the body, but it's, they're much lower. Um, uh, for, so, so we are wasting tremendous amounts in animal production in terms of what actually goes into human nutrition. And there are the ethical questions of is this, um, uh, you know, uh, are, is there humane treatment of these animals that are mass produced? Let me say, I do not predict and see in this book the end of animal meats. Um, I think we will see um, much, much more sophisticated, what we call these regenerative farms that, I that are raising cattle in a way um, that is um, very sustainable for the land, that actually, actually draws down carbon, these what they call carbon negative um, uh, cattle farms. It requires much more land to raise these animals. So they're much, it's much more expensive to raise beef this way. And we can get into what regenerative animal agriculture is. Um, so I still think that there will be a portion of the um, meat industry that is produced by animals in a much more sustainable way. But the mass production of beef and pork and poultry in particular um, in, the, in the current form is very unsustainable. It's very water intensive, very resource intensive, and ultimately very wasteful. Um, so cellular agriculture, um, to my mind, was exactly that revolting, I can't imagine this. But you can produce this meat with about 85 to 87% fewer carbon emissions and about 0.02% of the land. And when you think about how much land is caught up that is deforested and caught up in you know, cattle production globally, and, and what could happen if you take that land, you reforest it, you manage it sustainably, you bring native grasses into the land, you create carbon sinks, you draw down um, this extra CO2 in the atmosphere into the earth, you create much more um, health, you know, healthier and more fertile land. Um, it's, it's astonishing how exciting that is if we can do meat production with much less. And I'm talking about mass-produced meats, not, um, you know, not the craft meats, not the you know, special cuts, not the meats that you're eating at the um, Omni Hotel, right? Um, but if this can be good for human health, if it can be done with much, much uh, you know, lower CO2 emissions, um, with vastly uh, less water. I mean, it's the, the water savings are enormous, which again, you understand here in California. Um, the, the, the implications for land use, transformative land use, um, and you know, better management of our lands, not to mention better treatment of our animals, is really important. So we have to, we have to consider it, we have to consider it. Um, if, again, it is mo most importantly good for human health, delicious, nutritious, and so forth. So yes, I did taste um, cellular agriculture. It was a, it was a lab meatball, uh, duck, it was actually a duck breast produced in a bioreactor. And I signed my life away. And, uh, and I, you know, this is good for the story. Um, I might not live to tell the story, or maybe I'll start quacking tomorrow, who knows? Maybe it'll like fuse into my body and who knows. Um, and Uma, I was so taken with Uma Valetti, who's this brilliant cardiologist who had, you know, I'd been tracking this for years and finally it was ready. And he, his kids had eaten it, he had eaten it, so he seemed fine. So I said, all right, I'm in. And uh, this little meatball was about $700 for like a one ounce cost. I mean, this was in 2018 when I first tasted it. Now it's, the cost has come down dramatically because of course it's, you know, scaling. Um, very quickly, T billions, tens of billions of dollars are now going into this realm of, of cellular agriculture, which is not on the market yet, but, but will be. Um, and it was extraordinary because, and they were working on duck, because duck is the fastest growing demand for meat in China is duck. It's a very, very um, uh, beloved uh, source of protein in China. Um, and they were, you know, this was just that day. They were also producing um, 
chickens and chicken and beef, and you can do seafood and I mean pretty much anything that has a cell you can create in this form uh, or with this method. Anyway, I, ha I haven't eaten a whole lot of duck in my life, but they had this chef who then sautés this duck breast that's taken out of the bioreactor and, um, and serves it to me on a bed of lettuce with some like, you know, citrus something dressing, whatever. And it tasted exactly like duck meat because it is duck meat. It is cellularly identical to the meat that we consume off of the animal. Um, you know, fats and muscles and uh, the connective tissues, that's what they produced, that's what they cultivated, and that's what I consumed, and um, it was astonishing. It was astonishing to see that that's even possible. Um, but what I want you to take away from this, above all, is that ultimately all this is about how we treat the earth, right? And, and certainly our bodies. But this is really a question of land and how we use land on, on, on this earth to produce our food. And there is so, there, the practices, the current practices are so damaging, um, especially in mass production of grains and meats, um, that, that we really have come to this moment of um, self-reckoning, where we have to kind of figure, uh, come to terms with what is impossible. And that's breaking open this whole realm of innovative and creative thinking. Some of, the, some of the solutions I looked at, like there was a cloning operation that was terrifying, and I absolutely don't believe in that technology adaptation. But some of the ways that we're beginning to innovate, as we know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Some of the ways we're beginning to innovate are incredibly creative and, and, and hopeful. And all told, if better managed, the agricultural lands on planet Earth can draw down and, uh, and sequester more carbon dioxide the in, than the entire amount currently produced by the transportation industry, and almost as much as the CO2 currently produced by the electricity industry, by the power industry. Um, carbon is that dark matter in soil. It is the essential life-giving force in soil. It is the building blocks of life. Carbon is actually a very important nutrient. The, the, the more carbon, with every 1% increase in organic matter and carbon in soil, uh, organic matter in soil, which is you know, the microbiome, the healthy matter in soil, you can draw down 10 more tons of carbon per acre of land, right? So there's this virtuous cycle. If we manage our lands better, it can draw down and sustain and hold more carbon in, in the earth which makes healthier soil that can produce healthier crops, right? Um, but we have to shift the way we're using the land. And that means shifting what we eat, means shifting these, you know, large industries. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, I talk in the, in the book about robotics applications, these precision robotics applications that are finding ways to manage land um, much more intelligently with much less uh, chemical, much far fewer chemicals, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, and fertilizer. Over applications of fertilizer throw up all this nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, um, which is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So managing those chemicals much more intelligently using these um, technologies can have great, great climate uh, benefits. Um, these vertical farms, you can produce more leafy greens inside the space of these indoor cropping centers, you know, hydroponics and aeroponic centers, more leafy greens inside the space of a soccer goal in one of these facilities than it takes to produce in, the, in an entire soccer field outdoors, right? Again, it's about land and how we're using it. And there's still, there's still so much opportunity for backyard farms and community farms and in-ground uh, production, right? It doesn't make sense to grow all of our crops indoors, but there's a lot that can be done to liberate land that has been converted to very poor agricultural applications, do that in these other ways, and then reforest and rehabilitate this land that has been destroyed by industrial agriculture. Um, and the more I saw this, you know, uh, as, as I told this story, the more I saw this in, um, in this realm of, of, of robotics and AI, and you know, possible alternatives to meat production. And think about, you know, I know there are some flaws and people have questions about the um, health benefits of, for example, the Beyond Burger, 
or the Impossible Burger. Um, but plant-based meats use about 3% of the land that it takes to produce meat, um, uh, you know, uh, animal-based meats, right? It's, again, a question of what it will take to do this right. There are, you know, there, not all plant-based meats are, um, are, are as good as the next. I think the Impossible Burger, to my, as far as my research shows, um, you know, has far fewer human health benefits than, say, the Beyond Meat Burger. Um, and they'll continue to get better and better versions of this that are better and better for human health. But we have to do both. We have to manage our land better. We have to, you know, restore the degraded ecosystems that have been converted to agricultural use. And we have to protect and restore human health um, and, and the flavors and the nutrients in our food. These new breeding technologies can, I think, help um, address some of uh, those tremendous problems. Find just a final point, and maybe we'll have time for a question or yes. two. But a final point is, you know, hydroponics uses water instead of the soil, yes. and it adds these various nutrients. D aeroponics. Tell us what aeroponics is. Okay. Aeropo aeroponics. Yes. So hydroponics brings nutrient, and, you know, you've probably all bought hydroponic lettuce. Um, and, and so the, the roots of the plant are um, sort of hang down into a, a bed of water and the nutrients for the plants are um, released into this water and they're drawn up into the plants and so forth. Aeroponics is a mist. So the roots hang down into a mist of water um, and the nutrients are, um, are, are pulled into that mist. Again, it's a huge water advantage, right? So this is being readily adopted in, for example, the Middle East, which has very poor soil quality, very, very scarce water resources, and it uses about 97% less water than in ground farming. Um, so again, there's, uh, I mean, I've been to aeroponics facilities in California, in, in, in California, in New Jersey. They're, they're popping up all over the place. Um, and there's still great advantages to hydroponics. Um, it's just, again, much less water intensive. Um, and, and the other advantage for these indoor centers, which most of the lettuce, nine, you know, 90 plus percent of all the lettuce produced in this country is in Salinas uh, or Yuma, Arizona. Yuma's been dealing with tremendous climate pressures. Obviously, so has uh, Salinas. Why are we growing all of our lettuce in Arizona? I mean, and then trucking it to New York City. Like, it makes no sense. It's 90% water. <laughs> it just, it's, just a, it's just a dysfunctional system. So if some of that can be produced on, you know, closer to the point of consumption, in my case in Nashville, Tennessee, or in New York City, or wherever, um, then, yeah, you, you, you save a lot of water, you save a lot of land, um, and you save a lot of rot and food waste that happens in distribution, this long distance distribution. All of this is about also decentralizing production, right? Bringing the production of proteins and, and nutritious um, fruits and vegetables closer to the um, points of use. Yeah. Well, very good. And just one little piece of trivia is Memphis meats is from Berkeley, California. <laughs> so <laughs> no, <but> that uh, <laughs> Memphis Meats was actually, did, um, uh, Memphis was the first city in, if it was it, Egypt or Mesopotamia or something. So they named yeah. it as this sort of original sort of origin story. Then they, they, they rebranded it Upside Foods because people were getting very confused about yeah. Memphis Meats. Um, but uh, yes, We great have a minute point. and a half. Yes, so go ahead. Gentlemen. So yeah. what I've seen is the projections that somewhere, I mean, they're not suggesting the future that the population will index is going to go in the other way. It's going to tip yeah. way. And in 80 years, China will actually be half a billion. So uh, these long-term trends, do you think of those into consideration? 
Yes, and, and it's a great point. I think you're right that we that this projection that we will go from eight billion to ten billion in the next thirty years may very well be proven wrong. That is just based on current trend uh, growth trends. Um, but I agree with you that yeah. yeah. And, and that's been actually a real concern. People have been saying, we'll, you know, d we'll have declining population numbers, and therefore our economies are going to shrink, and this is the end of the world because, you know, we need more people to consume more, to grow more, you know, grow economies faster. And that's a big question. What is the relationship between population growth and food production and economic growth and how much more population um, growth will we, will we have? The, the, I think you may be right. We could be approaching peak population. We've certainly approached peak land. We cannot expand, <clears throat> you know, land use and land development any further. Um, we've pretty much harvested as much as we can on as many acres as we can. So how do we do more food or better food on less land um, with less climate and, and, and environmental impact? Leave us with questions. Our mics are going to be shut off in, in about <coughs> two seconds, and maybe even the lights will go out. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.